because there's no pointer. Oh, there it is. This is, this is the nerve, and then this is the muscle. And then the problem in MG is these, this triangle here is the acetylcholine receptor. And if you have an antibody um, that binds to the receptor um, that blocks it, then the signal doesn't go from the nerve to the muscle, and then you get weak. And that's the basis of it. But these antibodies were just found uh, in, uh, in, in, two, in 1973 and 1974. So uh, we, uh, in, in, in the National Myasthenia Gravis Foundation, there was a committee that was set up in the late 90s, and this paper was published in 2000, where we came up with new <coughs> classification for MG. And so this is what most doctors and patient groups use now to classify MG. It's called the MGFA classification. And it's simpler than the older versions that were used before that. So uh, very simplistically, ocular is ocular, it stays ocular. And then if it's generalized, there's mild, moderate, severe. And then if you're on a ventilator, it's crisis it's, or class five. And so trying to determine whether or not someone is mild, moderate, and severe, it's really up to the patient and the doctor. There's no firm criteria. There are ways to quantitate this, and I'll show you that in the next slide, but we decided to leave it fairly uh, uh, loose. Um, but there are some generalized patients in which the weakness is predominantly in the arms and legs, and some in which it's mainly in the swallowing and chewing muscles, and they have normal strength in the arms and legs. And so that's what the A and V is for each one of these groups. So this is the classification we use now. And then there are scoring systems which have been developed to quantify how bad MG is. These are mainly used in research studies, um, which I'll talk about in a minute. This is called the quantitative MG score, um, which usually is administered by a nurse or a physical therapist. Um, and you get a score, and the higher the score, the worse the MG is. And, and then the other one which we developed is called the MG Activities of Daily Living Score. This is something a patient can do on their own. And I actually believe that the Mycene Ferris Foundation of America has made this into an app, I think. I don't know how many patients use it. Does anyone use that app? So it, clearly not publicized well in Kansas City. Um, but, um, I, but this is something that patients can do on their own and um, just look at each one of these measures and, and grade where you're at on this three-point scale, normal at zero and three is bad, and, um, and then you can get a score and, and follow. And we use this in research studies, but I actually think <clears throat> we should be using this scale every time a patient comes to clinic. And we're gonna start doing that. Um, we, is, it in, is it in our electronic medical record yet, the scale? We're putting it in, yeah. So we want to actually do this every clinic visit and track your MG severity score through this. And this, this is um, becoming more and more important, um, not only for the patients and the doctors, but also uh, to prove that you're um, um, either getting better or getting worse for insurance companies and um, who are paying for expensive therapies and they want to know this information. So let's talk about treatment then. So uh, I sort of, broke up treatment simplistically into the class of drugs, which are acetylcholinesterase inhibitors. And we, when it was a trade drug, it went by mestinon. Now that it's generic, we, it's, it's pyridostigmine. And so most of the time we just order generic pyridostigmine unless a patient really wants the trade drug. And we can still do that, but the generic is cheaper. There still is, I think, neostigmine on the market. We have one or two patients who still take it. Does anyone in the room? I know we have some that we've been on it since the uh, early 60s, and they don't want to go off this drug. Um, but it's uh, pyridostigmine is much easier to use. And then the immunosuppressive drugs, which we'll talk about, and then surgery. So those are the, basically the treatments. And then we'll talk a little about research. And these treatments all were uh, came into practice uh, over the last um, 80 years, basically. Um, the drugs like Pyridostigmine really were developed in the 30s. Uh, uh, initially, thymectomy was first used in the 30s. Mechanical ventilation uh, came into effect where the patients could be put on a ventilator in the 50s. And then steroids were first used for myasthenia and plasmapheresis in the 1960s. And then these other drugs, azathioprine, cyclosporin, and mycophenolate. Whoops, how did I do that? 
I hit the wrong button. There it is. Um, and Michael Fenelay, uh and IVIG to some extent, they were all basically taken from other specialties, which were using these drugs for other reasons. And um, when, pe when people first started doing kidney transplants uh, in, the, in the 60s, and they were getting organ tissue rejection, they developed azathioprine and then cyclosporine and mycophenolate. And so we started using those drugs for MG. That's how they came about. Um, and IVIG was used for immune deficiency, and we started using it for MG. So the interesting thing is, um, and, the, and where we get into trouble uh, in ordering these drugs in some patients, even though they might work, is that none of them are FDA approved for MG. So if a drug is not approved by the Federal Drug Administration for disease, your insurance company and Medicare can refuse it. Just, they can. And, and you have no recourse except to argue with them. And sometimes we're successful, but sometimes we're not. And so it, it's amazing that we uh, MG patients are doing better and we have treatment for MG, but none of the drugs are FDA approved um, for MG. So it's a problem, actually, that we're dealing with and that, that we all should be worried about, patients and doctors. How quickly does it take for these drugs to kick in? Well, it depends on the drug. If you just do a simple adrophonium or tensilon test and you inject it right in the vein, it works in a minute or two. But if you take a pilopyridostigmine, it takes oh, 10, 15 minutes to work. When you think about plasmapheresis or IVIG, it takes a few days or a week or two to kick in. Um, and then prednisone, two to eight weeks. And then these other oral drugs, months really, and thymectomy, months or years. So. It, it, when you choose these drugs for MG, you really have to think about how long it's going to take for that effect to kick in, and is it a decision you want to make? And they're very, and the costs are very. And these are just rough estimates that we made up. Uh, actually, it's a few years ago, so I'm not even sure if they're still accurate. But uh, at the, at that time, uh, we estimated annual costs for these different for these different therapies are listed here. This may not be the cost that you pay because the insurance company would be paying it. Um, but uh, they're, they're cheap to expensive, as you can see. And some of the newer therapies that are coming out, which I'll talk about at the end, or which may come out, are really going to be expensive. And it really, and I'll, we'll talk about that a little bit. It really gives us a little bit of pause, even though we may get some breakthrough therapies for MG in the next year or two, which is exciting. The cost of these therapies is staggering. Um, that the drug company is going to charge, and so what does that mean for us? So first, pyridostigmine, or what, what we also call mestinon, and I think this is my only slide on this, and my message always to the patients and their families and to the young doctors I'm teaching about MG is don't use too much of this drug. That I, I really think that if you're taking one tablet 60 milligrams, and I think if you're taking one tablet three or four times a day, and you still have a lot of MG symptoms, then there's no point in going up on that dose, usually. Not, that's never black and white, but usually it's time to, to add another drug. Uh, and, uh, but some patients think that you know two tablets every four hours is better than one tablet three or four times a day. And if the patients really feel that way, that's fine. Um, but usually we go to other drugs after one tablet three or four times a day. Um, there are side effects, diarrhea, cramps, muscle twitches, and um, sometimes you can control those, sometimes you can't. We like to control the diarrhea side effects by using um, uh, anticholinergic medications called hyoscyamin sulfate. Um, and um, so if a patient is complaining of a lot of diarrhea or loose stools, then every time they take a mestinine dose, I have them take one of these pills. And it really works um, and, and it, uh, it's frequently. Um, and I think it's more makes more sense than taking low modal or um, emodium, um, so which is another option. So that's that's the slide on pyridostigmine or mestinon. So what about prednisone? So I got a few slides on prednisone. So there are different ways to give it, and I don't know if it makes, it, it, it probably is not important to focus on the, the ways that we can start, this is how you start prednisone. Um, you can either start very high doses, you can start very low doses, or you can start intermediate doses. And I, over the, over the years now, I have evolved. So I used to do this, then I did this, and now I'm doing this. So I'm putting a lot of our patients right off the bat on 20 milligrams of prednisone a day. I don't work up from five or 10, I just put them on 20. And, um, and often that's enough. If it isn't, then we go up. 
Um, but I usually don't start real high anymore unless the patient's in the hospital on a ventilator and getting plasma freeze or IVIG. Um, I, I usually start at this 20 milligram dose. So having said that, well, actually, here's the side effects. So you all know the side effects. But while you're reading the bad, bad, bad side effects of prednisone, let me say this, which will not make me your most favorite doctor. But prednisone is the most effective drug for myasthenia gravis. Despite all this stuff, and despite all these other new drugs we're going to talk about, prednisone actually works the best. Um, uh, you know, I, would, I guess some of you wish that weren't the case because of all these side effects, but it's true. And so, um, you know, a lot of times patients are reluctant to go on prednisone because they've either had the side effects or they know a family member who's had them um, uh, or a friend, and, it, and that's a tough decision to make. But prednisone really does work the best. So when we make this decision to go from uh, pyridostigmine alone to the immunosuppressive drugs, it's usually prednisone. Now, it could be one of the other drugs um, uh, uh, or, or infusions, but usually it's prednisone. So we, uh, these are all the side effects, um, or some of the side effects of prednisone. And so when someone is on, if you're gonna put someone on prednisone, uh, you have to uh, monitor them very closely for bone osteoporosis, um, uh, for diabetes, um, for low potassium um, and for cataracts. And so uh, this is sort of the concurrent management uh, program we use. I uh, used to really struggle with which type of vitamin D to give patients on prednisone. And, um, and now, and I used to use prescription vitamin D, and now I've sort of given that up, and I just use over-the-counter calcium with vitamin D, and I have a patient take one tablet twice a day and I monitor their bone scan, their DEXA scan annually, and if they start getting into that osteoporosis range or, uh, uh, or osteopenia or osteoporosis, then I send them to my, our internist to help manage that and to decide whether or not they should go on uh, Fosamax or not. I used to put them on Fosamax myself, and sometimes I will. Do you put it yourself still? Yeah, because, you know, Fosamax, when it first came out, seemed like this miracle drug for osteoporosis, and now it's got all these side effects. 